Is you, I, can, I can get one out of the way. Hey, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wino Wednesday. I um, hope nobody broke uh, wine today as much as I did today. This is the second day in a row that I've broken a bottle on my way out to deliveries. Um, and um, it took... Uh, quite the mops to get all of those wine stains up um, both yesterday and today. So that's how my day started. Um, but all of it is great because we're going to be drinking really amazing wine tonight and I get to share it with you all virtually. Super excited to welcome someone special here today. It is Sam Brothers. So everyone knows Sam Mom and Sam Pop. Here is Sam Brother. Hi. He um, just came in from Colorado, so um, the Sam family is uh, continuing to expand. I've also got a Sam sister here. <laughs> Hello, McKenna. Um, so really excited to uh, share my family um, with you all, share wine with you all. And um, yes, so we're going to be celebrating Independence Day by uh, featuring four different very independently thinking um, producers from California. So I wanted to do domestic wines. Independence Day, celebrate America. Um, but also I wanted to kind of highlight what made California great in the first place, which is its innovation, its forward thinking, it's willing to think outside of the box. Um, and I think um, there are four of these producers that, um, man, they just, they just, they embody that so well. And so those are the wines I want to share with you. So if you're tuned in. Um, if you're signed in to YouTube, you'll be able to participate in the chat room. And I really would love for you to all do that. So if you're watching live, um, make sure you're signed in. If you see up on the upper right corner, whatever that is when I'm pointing to, um, if it says sign in, you're not signed in. So sign in um, to whatever like email account is connected to your YouTube. That way you can participate in the chat room. And if this is playing up on your big screen TV, have it playing also on like a tablet or a phone, just on mute for the second device that you can more easily type in the um, um, in that second device for the chat room. That would be brilliant so that I can get your feedback on the wines as we taste them. And um, if you have any questions, I can better connect with you. So if you're tuned in, please tell me where you're tuning in from. Super excited to have you all here. So hi, Anna in Virginia Beach. So glad you're back, at least for a little bit. It's a... Uh, I've missed the live classes, obviously, um, in terms of like in-person live classes. Um, but um, in the meantime, we'll just keep doing these virtual classes. Tawana, um, not that everyone's not my favorite customer, but Tawana, man, you are like kind of my favorite virtual customer because you tune into all of the classes and have such great tasting notes and you're so committed and I'm just so inspired by your commitment to it. So it keeps me inspired. So, and Tawana says hi to mm -hmm. the Sam fam. Um, um, hey, Ryan, great to see you again. Yes, that is delicious. And we're going to be trying some of that. Holly from Chesapeake, a uh, uh, longtime uh, friend here and uh, super excited. I think this might be your first virtual class. If I'm not right, I'm getting a little confused, though. Time is meaningless these days. Um, and James and Danielle, awesome. Great to see you as well. Um, fabulous. We have a little bit of a smaller class Um and it's also going to be a little bit less formal than the blind tasting classes. Um, a little bit more information about the producers and a little bit less of the, let's spend 20 minutes on the smell of this wine before we move to tasting. So let me kind of break down how um, the, the um, class is going to go in terms of just um, order. Um, hey, Jen, good to see you again from Norfolk. We're actually gonna start with this wine. So this wine is the Tandu, is how that's pronounced. Um, it's the one liter bottle with the beer cap on it. Um, I love one liter <laughs> bottles because when the extra wine, that glass and a half extra wine is um, kind of the most brilliant um, idea ever. So we're gonna start with that. We're not gonna do wine side by side for this class, unless you want to, if you want to, go for it. But because these wines are so different, um, and we're just talking about the individual producers, probably more helpful to um, feature these wines individually. So we're gonna start with the Tandu. Go ahead and pour yourself, you know, three, four, five, six, ten 10 ounces, whatever, uh, whatever you like. Remember, you have a little bit of extra this wine. Next, we are going to open up this Pet Nat um, and we'll talk all about it, don't worry. It is confusing because it has a beer cap on it and a cork and it's slightly sparkling but not full. 
We'll discuss it. Don't worry about it. So keep this in the fridge until we are ready to feature it. And uh, we'll get to that um, next. The third wine we're going to taste is the donkey and goat. And if you can, if you have room in your fridge, go ahead and pop this donkey and goat red bottle after you've opened it. Go ahead and open it and then pop the bottle in the refrigerator. I really, really enjoy this wine with a slight chill. I didn't want it chilling all day, so I didn't put that in the class instruction emails. Um, but it does taste amazing with a slight chill on it, and we'll talk about why. Um, but in the meantime, until we're ready for this, like the next 40 minutes or so before we get to it, go ahead and pop the donkey and goat, um, this label right here, in the refrigerator. And then finally, we're gonna taste this bottle right here. You can go ahead and open that up so it's breathing. Um, doesn't, none of these wines seem to be decanted or anything like this. And this we can just taste at the temperature that you have it out. So four different wines, one white, then we're gonna go to the sparkling wine um, and you'll see why. And then we're gonna do a chilled red and then a non-chilled red. So hopefully y'all are down for the count to try some of these really interesting uh, fun wines. So, hi Brian from Suffolk. Um, great to see everybody here. Thank you so much for tuning in, all of you from Williamsburg to Virginia Beach. Um, I've um, literally been in like seven cities today, and but now I get to see you all and participate all together. So, all right. First things first, let's talk about these sheets too. Because we're not doing this really academic blind tasting class where we're going to be going through this sheet individually, line by line, every single wine, um, this is for your own use. We're going to talk about this for the first wine and then use it as much or as little as you like. This should be a fun class. Um, we should just be like experiencing, trying some new things and celebrating what California has to offer. So if you wanna be academic and go through every step of the way, then that's awesome. That's what these tasting sheets are for. So on one side, you have one, a white wine, one and two, and then on the back, red wine, one and two. Um, use them, don't use them. Make a paper hat out of them and wear it. I don't, if you do, send me a picture, please. <laughs> um, but it's totally up to you. So we're not gonna be as academic uh, in this tasting as we are for the rest. Um, so hopefully everybody has the tandu poured a little bit in their glass and the donkey and goat in the refrigerator and that pet nat still in the refrigerator. Um, I'm gonna go through real quickly, just uh, the tasting components, um, the the step-by-step um, -step guide of how to taste wine. And then the rest is gonna be up to you. And then I'm just going to talk about the producers, why I love these producers, and hopefully you will fall in love too. So this is what I'm going to be going through, this Wine 101 um, tasting sheet. So sight, most people skip over when they are doing um, tastings. They go straight to smelling or straight to the real fun part, the drinking. And we skip sight, and that tells us actually a lot. So if you hold it up to the light, give it some good swirls. Um, Hopefully, well, my glasses are a little dusty. I don't know if I polished them well enough uh, last time I uh, used them, but um, you should have some probably condensation on the outside of your glass. Um, and you're looking for clarity. If it's cloudy or hazy, we'll definitely get to a cloudy and hazy wine with our sparkling wine. So notice that this is a clear wine. For color, you're just holding it on its side and you're looking straight down. So on its side, almost horizontal, look straight down and you're seeing what color it actually is with a white background. If you hold that to the light, you're getting a totally different color than if you hold it on its side about two inches above a white background. White wines generally range from straw, that's this pale, yellow right in the middle to gold all the way at the end. This is definitely that straw color Hints of yellow, but not intense. Concentration, we'll get to that more with the reds, but you can easily read through this, definitely. And then finally, the legs are after you swirl the wine, when it settles, you're looking for the teardrops of the wine as forms and falls inside the glass. That tells us alcohol percentage. So the slower the legs form and fall, the thicker they are, the more defined they are, the more time it looks like those legs do crossfit, um, then the higher the alcohol content. If they fall down super slow, I mean super thin and fast and it's difficult to see and kind of make out, then lower alcohol content. 
And then if you have in your glass, what I am experiencing right now, it's like the Windex effect where it's almost just breaking apart and instead of forming lines and falling down, it's just from breaking apart in the glass. It's called sheeting, S-H-E-E-T-I-N-G, sheeting. That indicates really low alcohol content, generally less than 12%. So let's see here. Yep, 10.3, baby. We are low, low, low alcohol content, especially for California, which tends to focus on pretty high alcohol content wines, thanks to its warm climate and, you know, global warming. So let's get into the smell. Next reason why we really give some wines um, good swirls in the glasses is to release those aromatics. Notice the intensity, how much is it rushing up out of the glass at you versus being quiet and reserved and shy. Is it an extrovert wine or an introvert wine? And then see if you can name some fruit, some non-fruit, and then think about the condition of those things. So if you smell lemon, which is always a correct answer with any white wine, um, if you smell lemon, think about the condition. Is it super ripe or is it underripe? Are you smelling like the membrane and pith and like the bitter part? Um, or are you smelling the zest that you would just put, you know, sprinkle on on top of a meal to lift your flavors up? Is it Meyer lemon? Is it lemon curd? Is it lemon bar? Um, the condition of whatever you name is often more important than the actual thing that you are smelling by itself. Um, and then we're going to get into the tasting. That's the real fun part. Um, and um, what I always like to do is do one taste, and that's the simple taste. That's the, the initial meet and greet. That's the head nod. It's the, um, you just meet someone and you, and you form a first impression. It's a small <laughs> sip, and then you swallow it down right away. And just kind of figure out, am I tasting the same thing as I am smelling? The next sip that you're going to take, is a larger sip. You're gonna swish around your mouth, swirl it, chew it, slurp it, gargle it, whatever you wanna do. The more noise you make, the better. And remember, no one's watching you. You're not on camera. So if you end up like spitting out your nose and it, you know, whatever, and you're coughing and spewing all over the place, no big deal. No one can see that. It's not like you're doing it on live camera, which I have done before, um, snorted wine on live camera on accident. So um, you're okay. We're going to get through the actual taste palette, but just enjoy tasting it. Think about smelling it. And while you do that, I am going and use that wine aroma wheel, that wine aroma chart, sorry, right here. If you're trying to name anything that you're smelling, that you can't really quite put your finger on. Um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about Matthiasin Winery and why it's the bomb. So enjoy the wine and um, in a little bit, I'll ask for your tasting notes. Um, while you're writing those tasting notes, I'll chat with you about this wine. So Matthiasin Winery um, is uh, owned by Steve Matthiasin, his wife Jill. Um, Steve Matthiasin is one of the leading viticultural consultants in all of Napa. So he travels around to multiple wineries, telling them how they can better make their vines healthier, their vineyards healthier, and thus make better tasting wine. So he is a winemaker. He is making wine. But his primary area of expertise is actually the health of the vineyards. He is meticulous and type A to the nth degree, like I thought I was type A, but then I attended a seminar in DC that in three hours, I learned more from him than I have in like the last two years of my life combined, not exaggerating at all. He has spreadsheets of every single one of his vineyards that indicates individual plants and individual rows and the width of each of their cane shoots of each individual shoot of each individual vine so he can most accurately track the health of his uh, vines. Really fascinating. So um, he started, uh, he's, he's been in Napa for um, a couple decades for sure, um, but has recently started the second label that he does. So he has his Matthias and brand wines. Um, I'd love to feature those, but they're hard to get and they're pretty darn expensive, but man, are they worth it when you get it. I have his rosé actually featured on my success if you are interested. Um, but this is his second label called Tandu. He has a white and a red, um, and it's always in a liter bottle on the white with a beer cap. And this is Vermentino. So Vermentino 
is an Italian grape. It's also grown in France, um, Mediterranean climate. So you have it in Corsica, which is Italian, French, you know, kind of both culturally. Um, you have it on the Italian coast. You have it in uh, on the Mediterranean coast of France as well. A few producers. What I love about Vermentino is it's the perfect summer wine when I'm eating it with dinner. So to me, there's a difference in summer wine when I'm drinking it by itself. I just want acid, right? I just want something refreshing because it's hot out. It's humid here in Virginia. Um, and that refreshing quality of more acidic, bright, fresh, clean white wines is what I want. But when I'm pairing with dinner, I still want that refreshing quality, but I want some sort of complexity and depth to it. And the minerality on this wine kind of like coats your palate, um, kind of feels like you just, um, it just rained here. So if you have a second, like just run outside and smell the air. Um, the smell of the rain evaporating off the sidewalks and the asphalt um, and your driveway, all of that, that smell in the air, that is minerality. And um, that's what we smell in wine. You're just smelling literally box in aerosol form. Um, not really literally, but you know what I mean? Um, and obviously loads and loads and loads of lemons. So you have some of these other richer fruits like melon and tangerines and white flowers. That minerality kind of gives it some weight and depth and texture to the wine, which I love with oysters, I love with seafood, I want with tacos, chips and salsa, guacamole, all of my favorite summer foods, Vermentino is perfect for. So keep your eye out for that. Um, one of the big things that Mathiasen is um, uh, keen on, Steve Mathiasen is keen on, is pruning practices in the vineyards. And so basically, vines are invasive species, right? They want to take over the world. If you've ever seen Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you know this. Um, but it's, it's, it's true, they are invasive species, Virginia creeper, we know this, it's, it's just, it's super invasive and it grows like wildfire. If the vine is in fertile soil, then it wants to grow. It's spending all its energy on growth and expansion of its territory that's, that it's claiming. If it's in infertile territory, that means soil that's poor, it doesn't actually have good nutrients to it, maybe not ready access to water either, um, then the vine is gonna struggle a little bit more. And a struggling vine actually makes for better wine because the grape itself becomes the focus of the energy of the vine. So instead of expanding, the vine is struggling. So it thinks in its head, um, I might not survive. So I need to put all of my energy and resources and focus on propagating, spreading my seed throughout the earth. So I'm going to make the grapes themselves taste so good that the birds cannot resist them. So the birds are gonna come when it's ready and spread the seed literally throughout the world. Um, that is what the vine is gonna focus on if it's struggling. Instead of growth, it's gonna put all that energy into making really, really, really tasty grapes. Well, that's helpful when you're making wine because we make wine from grapes. And so the better tasting the grape itself, the better health of the, um, the, the grape, the better balance of that, the better it's gonna be. Now, obviously you can't have it struggle too much because then it's just trying to survive and it can't put any energy to anything. So it's about finding that balance and, and a lot of how you do that as a viticulturalist, as someone who's in the vineyards, not the winery, is through pruning. So it's a big deal and he's kind of known for his pruning practices. Uh, on his Matthiasen label, his label is just this graphic of all of these um, pruning shears kind of layered on top of each other. So that's what he's known for. People pay him big bucks um, to tell them how to better prune the vines to make them healthier. Um, well, let's talk about what we are tasting and smelling in this wine. Now that you thought about, uh, yes, a water blizzard. That is so true. Um, it wasn't rain today. It was a water blizzard. I know it felt like I had hail um, that I thought was actually going to crack my windshield when I was driving today. Um, it was so bad. So um, crazy weather. Um, hail is not good for vines. Um, that's one of those hail, frost, and too much rain or not enough rain. Um, not enough rain is better than too much, but those are the things that are terrible for vineyards too. Tell me what you're smelling and tasting in this wine. Go ahead and type it in the chat room if uh, you're tuned in with us. Tandu Aroma from Tawana says, I'm picking up some fresh green pear notes, cool with hints of river rocks. So yes, all of those minerality 
Love the green pear. Um, yes, I am. Um, we used to make, at the bar I used to work at, we used to make these pear mimosas that had like this pear concentrated nectar. Um, and yeah, I can totally see that. Um, how much floral or herbaceous quality is anyone getting in this? If at all. So I went from lecture mode to you talk to me mode uh, real fast. Um, aroma, rush of buttered popcorn. Yeah, there is some creaminess to this, some weight and depth um, um, before you could smell anything else. Hopefully that's blown off because there's so much fruit going on. I got a little bit of, like green pepper in here too. Um, lots of green things, green and yellow. If like there's two colors that this wine embodies, it's green and yellow. Every yellow fruit you can think of and lots of green things. Pepper, like some, maybe some like sweeter herbs, not like thyme, oregano, bay leaves. Those are really bitter, but almost like basil, tarragon, sage on this one. All right, Sam Pop, he always has the most interesting aroma notes. What you smelling? I'll put it in there. Um, oh, yeah. I know there's a delay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sam Pop says, um, perfectly balanced with grapefruit, light fruit, all fresh with mint, basil, and light mineral. Awesome, yes. Okay, so often, you know, um, um, Sam Pop has some... Um, off the wall. Off the wall, <laughs> yes. Great, great way to call it. Um, aroma notes, and um, it always challenges me to... That's for the Go back for that second smell. That's for the fourth one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for the third and fourth wines, especially, he says. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely agree with all of those, actually. Spot on. Um, Jen says lemon, apricot, um, um, river rocks. Yes, yes, yes. Having trouble picking up on the floral thing. Okay. That's fine. Um, definitely agree with green. So some people's noses are more sensitive to certain things than others, especially if you're around a certain thing a whole lot. Um, so um, who was it? It was in another, oh, it was in a private Zoom event that I did recently that they kept smelling iron, but like welding iron, like um, like uh, that was what they were smelling in some of these wines. Like, well, I've never smelled that, but he was picking up on it because that's what you know, connected more to his memory. So don't try and smell necessarily the same thing everyone else is smelling around you, um, even myself. Um, focus on like what you are picking up and, and expand from there. Um, Twana says, complex and heavy on the tongue, really coats the inside of the mouth, definitely getting a lot more lemon rind in the taste compared to the aroma. All right, cool, some brioche. So we're getting some creaminess, some brioche biscuity, yeasty thing. Um, a lot going on this wine uh, for something that um, is meant to just be like an everyday white wine. And that's what I love about his wines. Is they're, they're so dynamic um, while being at a perfect everyday price point. So. Hmm. Wow. So much minerality. It's just like I have chalk dust in my mouth and notice how much your mouth is watering too. So while the wine is kind of waiting, kind of coats your tongue in terms of that minerality, the acidity keeps it so vibrant and fresh. My mouth is watering a whole lot, puckering a whole lot in the back of my mouth. That, so that acid level is high. I'd say on a scale of one to five, um, we're talking like three and a half, four for acid level. So sweetness level, if you're trying to figure out like, oh, there's a lot of fruit going on in here. Is this a sweet wine or not? Um, you can stick just the tip of your tongue into the wine. Concentrate um, the wine just on the part of your tongue that experiences the most sweetness or this, the most sensitive to sweetness. I have no sweetness feeling on the tip of my tongue at all. Um, yeah, so so we're dry. I almost like get that chalkiness on the tip of my tongue too. So this is borderline like bone dry is what we'd call it. Um, tannin, we'll skip that and do that with the reds. Um, body is just kind of how heavy it sits on the tongue. So this is actually a fuller bodied white wine than it might seem because it's richer fruit and that intense minerality kind of like sits heavier on the tongue. And the finish, how long did that taste continue and linger on uh, your tongue and in your mouth? 
I'm getting, man, I mean, that was like my first like real sip um, since I just made sure that the wines were good, but lots going on and, and it's, and it's, and it's lingering quite a bit, kind of hanging out there. What did you think? Are you disagreeing? We nailed it. But we disagree. <laughs> All right, so per usual, Sam Mom and Sam Papa are over here disagreeing about the wine, which is why when I'm going on vacation next week um, with the, fam the whole family to the Outer Banks, and I've obviously bringing all the wine, and so we've got a bunch of wines we're going to taste, and when they come back, I'm going to have a Sam Pop six-pack and a Sam Mom six-pack. So if you find yourself uh, leaning towards one or the other in terms of their tasting notes and style, um, you can actually pick their favorite wines and uh, read their reviews on those wines. So I don't know if they knew that I signed them up for that, but uh, surprise! Sounds yeah. fun. That lingering flavor continues to develop and change. Awesome. Overall balance, I find this wine pretty balanced. All the flavors are coming together really well. Complexity, I'm actually surprised at how complex it is. Um, definitely not the most complex wine I've ever had. It's not like I want to write three pages of tasting notes, but there's, there's quite a bit going on. And the final conclusion, how does it all come together? I just love it. Like, I can't get enough of this wine. I love his reds. I love his whites. I love his rosé. Never made, I've never had a wine that he has made that did not make me go, yeah, I'll have some of that. Um, so, um, cool. Well, what did, what, what is your overall conclusion on the wine? Love it? Hate it? Ah, so-so? Definitely see it in one occasion. Where would you experience this? Where would you enjoy this? On the beach, lunchtime, in your coffee cup at work, you know. Um, <laughs> um, James said they love. Awesome. <sighs> yeah, there's just um, um would make a great white sangria with grapefruit. Yeah, I, um, yeah, um, yeah, if, if you start with great products, then uh, you, can't, you can't go wrong from there. I would be hesitant to put anything in this wine because I think it's so delicious by itself. And I think you can make really great sangria with cheaper wine. Um, and I always like to save the stuff I want to drink by itself for what I want to drink by itself, but you do you. And if you want to make the sound of sangria, that would be really good sangria. Um, complexity makes it a great porch wine. Yes, so a lot going on, but it's not gonna like overpower you, overwhelm you, kind of weigh you down. So as you finish up this wine, um, we are going to go on to the pet mat. Um, sparkling wine made in a fish it. You can use a spit cup or a jump cup. Um, you don't have to switch glasses. Once you taste this next wine, you'll see that uh, this wine is going to overpower any remnants of wine left over in your glass. So don't rinse out your glass uh, with water at all. So, man, it's just so good. So I've been featuring, I had that wine by the glass at two of my restaurants, um, the two restaurants that I, um, that I managed um, for a while. And every vintage is so different because if, if you're truly letting the vines speak for themselves, vintages will vary over time. If a wine tastes exact same every single vintage, that's more like a constructed wine. They're making that wine in the winery. They're like, it's kind of like a, a formulaic wine is what I call it, versus really dynamic wine that's, that speaks the terroir and, and tells you about the vintage that it has. So, um, all right. So, pet nut here. We're going to taste through this dry hop. Pet Nat from Field, Field Recordings. Um, and um, it's fitting we're going to do this before the reds because this wine is um, almost more like a red wine um, than uh, anything else. There's, a, there's, there's just so much going on. It's a really interesting, funky wine for sure. While you're pouring this, just taste through this and enjoy it. Focus on the smell because there's a lot going on. Notice how cloudy it is. So this wine is unfiltered. We'll talk about why every single pet nat is unfiltered wine. We'll talk about what pet nat is. If you want a full explanation of pet nat, um, I do have a YouTube video. I think it's like episode four or so um, just on pet nat or what we call petulant natural. Bacon. 
basically how sparkling wine first started to be made. So sparkling wine was an accident, right? Nobody wanted the bubbles in wine. They actually tried to get rid of the bubbles, but couldn't really figure out how to do this. This started in France, um, in Limoux, um, which is on uh, in Languedoc, and Champagne, um, almost about the exact same time. And what happens is as you ferment the wine, Fermentation 101, yeast eats the sugar of the grape. That is just naturally in the grape. The byproduct is alcohol, gets us drunk, and carbon dioxide or bubbles. Um, before they understood what fermentation really was, before they have Louis Pasteur, they don't understand what's going on with fermentation. We're talking like 1200s, 1300s. We're definitely in the dark ages. They just basically basically squish the grapes around in these big barrels or vats and um, drain them off and knew that after they stopped bubbling, it was good. Um, and then um, they either kept them in the barrels or vats or um, in like pig skins kind of thing. This is before bottles were really actually good at capturing like um, being a vessel for wine because the glass wasn't thick enough. Clay jars, anything like that. Um, well, in some of these areas in France, they were waiting so late into the year to pick the grapes because it was such a cool climate. Champagne is very, very far north in um, France that they have to wait so far into the year to pick them that by the time they pick them, it's closer to like November than we think of harvest as like September, August now, um, and no, um, October. So if you wait till November to pick them, you're gonna put all these grapes down fats and start the fermentation process um, and it's getting cold out and there's no heat or conditioning or anything like that there's no temperature control in these cellars so yeast goes dormant at about 43 degrees Fahrenheit so while this fermentation process is starting yeast is eating the sugar getting that party on making that alcohol and carbon dioxide it's bubbling off they're waiting then it gets colder and colder and colder because now we're getting into December um, and so the yeast just goes to sleep it's slower and slower and it just goes to sleep. So obviously those bubbles stop forming carbon dioxide is not being made anymore. It's not a byproduct because fermentation has halted, but yeast doesn't die. It just goes to sleep at this time. So winemakers are like, all right, we're ready. We're going to seal these barrels up and ready to go because it stopped bubbling. So we know it's done. Well, come springtime, it starts warming up again. And springtime, um, what happens to all these barrels that have since been sealed with a top and tar and all that stuff? Well, they start exploding. Um, the carbon dioxide starts forming in the wine again as the yeast wakes up and starts that fermentation process again, builds up the pressure to the barrels to the point where the barrels are exploding. They actually made suits of armor, like special suits of armor for cellar workers because I laugh, um, people died. Uh, people died in these cellars and they had to actually create, um, we all know, it was basically the champagne PPE, you know, so um, just to protect uh, all the cellar workers. So. They finally figure out what's going on with these bubbles. Oh, it's the temperature and this is how we can control it. So then they start actually fermenting it in the bottles. And now we're talking like 1800s because you needed coal fired glass plants that didn't really happen until the 1800s in England. So now we've got thicker glass that's not gonna explode, which is awesome. And now we've got these beer caps basically that are gonna seal it for us. And so when people finish fermenting, and add a little bit of yeast and a little bit of sugar, cap it on that side, and then that's gonna actually continue fermenting in the bottle. Because now, while they were trying to get rid of the bubbles before, now everyone all over the world is talking about this fizzy wine that's being made in France, and everyone wants more and more and more. It's awesome. So they're asking for it, and they're like, oh, this is, we have a hedge on the market. We, got, we, 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 we have something no one else has, so let's own this. So they put the beer cap on and make this fizzy wine in here called Petulant Naturel. So this fermentation process that actually finishes in the bottle, um, but it's cloudy, right? It's cloudy, it's hazy, it's not necessarily super clear. Back before we learned how to control it even more, you actually had like stringy, yeasty, gloppy stuff. Like if you've ever had like real natural kombucha, you know at the very end you get this like gloppy, 
um, stuff in it. And so that's in all of the bottles. So we're trying to figure out how to get rid of that, but keep the bubbles. So basically figure it out. Again, talking 700 years of history here is how they figured it out. That um, how to how to um, um, expel the yeast um, while keeping the bubbles. And by that, I mean, they, let's pretend this is a bottle of wine. Beer cap on here finishes the secondary fermentation process in the bottle. They slowly, slowly, slowly age it until it's upside down. So all of that yeast is in the neck of the bottle. Then they freeze just the neck of the bottle in super, super cold water. Um, and so the yeast that's sunk to the neck of the bottle freezes and becomes solid. They flip it upside down, they take off the beer cap and the pressure shoots up this like solid piece of frozen yeast where all of that stuff gets out, but they keep the bubbles on. They put a champagne cork in one of those special cages and that's how they basically um, got bigger bubbles and controlled that fermentation process. But that first style of just like one fermentation process happening in the bottle, it's called Petulant Naturel. So not only is pet nat is what we call it now because it's easier to say and pronounce than Petulant Naturel. So old school style of winemaking that's now become a lot more popular, especially with these like hipster songs that are making, making things cool again. Um, they knew about it before, you know, before it was popular kind of thing. But not only is Andrew Wall, winemaker of field recordings, doing a pet nap, which is cool in and of itself, but he's actually aging this wine in beer hops before it goes into bottle. So this is like the perfect balance between a beer and a wine. And so if you, um, if you love wine, but your partner loves beer and you struggle to ever find anything that you can share, this might be the perfect thing. So if you smell the wine, it smells funky, right? It smells like apple cider, like that natural fermentation. All pet nat is gonna have a little bit of funk to it. So it's gonna be cloudy, a little bit of funky, but it smells like those grapefruit hops, that like really good beers are, are known for. Um, and so it's just a really fun, interesting, outside of the box experiment that they did. That they say that the, their only regret in this experiment is not doing it sooner because it's been so popular. Only a little bit of this was made because this is the first experiment that they've done. They're gonna make a lot more next year, I promise. Um, but we have a few cases. So if you're interested, if you like it and want to have some more, let me know ASAP because I can get it to you. So, um, all right, talk to me about what you are tasting and smelling in this wine. Um, this to me, like, I want to put fruit in this and um, like make a weird beer wine penat sangria thing would be really delicious on the beach for sure. Um, yes, uh, Jen says the cork under the bottle cap was a surprise. Yes, and especially when you open it and then it, you know, pops up and you have that, uh, that wine coming out of the neck of the bottle from the pressure, also a surprise too. So, um, Great question. Can you swirl this wine or wines like this so much that it goes flat? Yes, absolutely. Because as you swirl this and the bigger the glass you have too, the more, the more surface area you have where those bubbles are evaporating. So you can absolutely do that. You're still going to get all the taste, but those bubbles are going to dissipate. So here's a solution for this. So I've learned this over the years and you're getting like firsthand knowledge from someone who's been in the industry for a long time. I know all of the trips, Ticks, trips, tricks and tips. That's what I'm trying to say. And here's the way you keep us. Uh, you drink it faster. Mm -hmm. um, if you drink it faster, the bubble is still always going to be good. So um, it's, I, I laugh, I guess, but it's actually true. So for sparkling wine, I like to pour it in a bigger glass because I like to smell it. But I just pour it in smaller amounts so that I can swirl and smell, really get it but I'm not worried about my whole six ounce glass of wine going flat. So just pour yourself smaller amounts so you can really enjoy all aspects of the wine. But yeah, drink it faster. So um, Steve Hill, Sun Pop says, green apple, lemon, grapefruit, beer. Yes, with some black and white pepper, perfect with pizza. I want like a margarita pizza with this. Um, I don't know if I'd want it with like anything tomato based, but a just like a, a classic white pizza would be perfect. So Ryan says, I don't have one to taste right now, but does it smell a little bit doughy? It does, but it smells taking, taking, and I'd say 
you got a little bit of this yeasty thing going on, but it's definitely not like over the top. It's not brioche or biscuity or anything like that because it's not aged on the leaves for a long time. So you don't get a lot of that kind of yeasty texture or a component to the wine. So Tawana says, pet nut aroma, hops. Yes, grapefruit for sure. Picking up on some herbal tea. Yeah, um, like Earl Grey, Jasmine, um, almost like some like white cherry. Um, yeah, like some white cranberry, white cherry notes in there. Um, and um, all right, awesome. So Tawana, what did your husband um, say? Does Is he there? Is he able to taste this wine? I'm super curious because um, I know he's a beer drinker. So. Um, so I don't know what kind of hops the producer used. Um, I could probably ask them and find out, um, but I won't do that right now. No. Um, and barbecue, yeah, or um, yes, um, absolutely. I'd want this with like um, pork bon mi sandwiches. Um, that vinegary note would be really awesome. A little bit of that spicy, that chipotle uh, mayo on it, the um, pork um, the, the pulled pork and all of those pickled vegetables would be awesome. So ginger. Yeah, absolutely. S spicy ginger, right? There's, there's, there's some definitely some like ginger and white pepper for sure going on here. <sighs> Love those calls. There's a lot going on in this wine. This to me is what I call the starbursty wine, right? Where it's just like pals of flavor going, poo, poo. not pals of like flavor of starburst, but just the flavor is so bursty and they're just kind of uh, all in their own corner. Fireworks. Not necessarily fireworks. Great. Awesome. Perfect for Independence Day. Great. Um, not the most like compiled, balanced and integrated wine, but certainly really, really interesting. So seems a little bit like a Saison beer. Yeah. Uh, ego, um, alter ego by Smart Mouth. Yes. Um, that farmhouse, that kind of wild thing, all these natural fermentations um, are going to have more of that wild characteristic um rather than let's say um something where they use cultured yeast and so again more that formulaic wine so um cool well what do y'all think thumbs up like would you enjoy this wine would you um share it with the beer lover in your life i um i don't even know if i really want this with and i could do it with food yeah but it's just so delicious by itself. It's uh, it's hard to think about doing it with food. And man, I can't get past that tea note. Great call on that. Like almost over steep. There's some like bitter components to it too. Um, cooked fruit. So much floral component. All right, sorry. I was asking you what if you liked it, not what you smelled anymore. So keep it in stock for sure. Okay, I will do my best to keep this in stock. Um, if you are interested, like I said, they made very small amount of this wine. Virginia only got a few cases. So I've already gone through a couple of them. So if you are interested, get your orders in sooner rather than later on this wine. So, all right. Whenever you're ready, as you're finalizing your notes on this wine and finishing your glasses, uh, we are going to pull out that donkey goat from the refrigerator that was chilling down a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about biodynamics. So again, I have a whole YouTube video on biodynamics if you're interested. Um, so um, uh, if you want more information, definitely check out that video because there's tons of information out there about it. And it doesn't matter how many videos are done, there's still just so much to learn and know about biodynamics. So. Donkey and Goat is the producer. We are in El Dorado County, California, um, where they first found gold. And um, the grape is Muvedra. That is how that grape is pronounced. Muvedra is, but the, the R is not really apparent. So just Muvedra. Um, you can even swallow the D-R-E and just Muvedra um, is kind of how uh, the French would say it. So this grape is native to the south of France in uh, southern Rome along the Provence and Languedoc um, and Roussillon areas as well. This is unfiltered as they get. This is uh, hands-off and it's carbonic maceration. So we're gonna talk about all of these weird things as um, we taste. Um, Y'all know the drill um, in terms of just how you go yourself a few ounces of this and we'll chat about 
biodynamics, carbonic maceration, and um, wines like this. It's going to be hard to keep on focus right now for the learning part of it because it just smells so interesting. I can't get it up. Okay. So real quick basics of biodynamics. Um, 1920s. Um, Rudolf Steiner, scientist and a farmer, um, basically creates this idea of biodynamics. Biodynamics um, as a growing practice for crops and fruit um, is less like organic or natural because that is a system. That's something that you do this and you don't do this. It's just a system. Biodynamics is a philosophy. It is not only what you the cosmos and the greater world and the universe and and what world we are creating here by digging into the earth. So let me break that down. Basically, biodynamics is about creating the best ecosystem, the best small ecosystem, um, the best medium ecosystem, the best large ecosystem, and the best ecosystem within the entire cosmos. So to have the healthiest ecosystem, you need to be holistic. So if you um, use nitrates um, as fertilizers, um, then that will change your ecosystem. If you prune a certain way, that will change your ecosystem. If you irrigate or don't irrigate, that will change your ecosystem. If you literally break up all of the local land and so you have no other natural wildlife in terms of animals or plants, flora or fauna, that changes your ecosystem. And all these things affect ultimately the finished product. So Rudolf Steiner, who created this, was not a vigneron. He was not a grape grower. He was not tending vines specifically to make wine. It's just farming practices in general. But it's really been taking hold in the wine community and with great success. So basically, their idea is just like we talked about with the first wine with Steve Mathiasen, is the healthiest possible vine is gonna produce the best fruit. So to make the healthiest possible vine, you can do one or two things. You can make it healthy in and of itself with a natural immune system, or you can go down the rabbit hole of spraying nitrates and then it's then, then it's prone to this disease. You gotta spray for this disease, then you gotta spray for this disease. And once you start spraying, it's almost impossible to stop. Um, so those are the two avenues you can kind of make. Well, how do you make your vine healthy in its own natural way? How do you build up a vine's immune system? It's all about the microbes in the dirt. So we can dirty here with this stuff. And those microbes live in and around and off of the root vi um, the, the roots of the vines. So as the roots suck up their um, their nutrients through the root hairs, they absorb these um, nutrients through um, water dissolved nutrients in the soil. They leach into the soil carbohydrates. Wouldn't that be nice if I could like absorb all my nutrients, but equally <laughs> expel all carbohydrates while I did so? That would be really wonderful. The vines do that. So they expel carbohydrates into the soil while they absorb their nutrients. Well, these tiny microbes eat those carbohydrates and that's how they survive. Well, these microbes literally also absorb diseases and pests in the soil before they're able to affect the roots of the vines themselves. So the more of those healthy microbes you have living around the roots of the vine, then that is the immune system of the vine. So it doesn't get as sick and it's not as prone to all of these diseases that are in the soils and just kind of naturally around. So those microbes are what you need. Those microbes do not exist in sterile soil. So if you start spraying um, all of these chemicals in your vineyards, then those chemicals turn the soils um, sterile. So they're not going to be they're not going to be a suitable environment for these microbes. So those microbes die, which means the immune system is gone, which means that vine is going to be prone to all these diseases. So that's why it's that downward spiral of needing to spray more and more and more and more anytime you start spraying because it makes actually the vine itself more prone to diseases. So that's what biodynamics is about. It's about creating the healthiest soil and you do that with natural fertilizers. So you have sheep just roaming in the vineyards, uh, fertilizing the way they do best. Um, you have flowers that um, certain wildflowers protect from certain diseases. You have, if you have, um, um, you're trying to do no fences so that all of these 
um, animals in their natural habitat can coexist equally with the vines. You're also not just focusing on vines, they're also growing other cover crops in between. Um, they're, they're growing other crops around to make sure that the soil balance is perfect. And it's just creating this perfect harmony of this ecosystem of the vineyard. But here's where biodynamics turns a little, a little um, cuckoo, some people would say. Um, I'll leave that up to you. And they believe that not only are we trying to create this ecosystem within just the land that we own and we're tending, but we as humans on planet Earth exist within the ecosystem of the cosmos. Um, so sun and everything else going around changes what's happening here on planet Earth. So they will only plant on certain days. They'll only harvest on certain days. They say wine tastes better on certain days. So here's an app if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about this. Um, the app is called um, When Wine. Um, this is kind of the symbol of it right here. And so there's four days basically is what they say. So there's flower day, which is really good for pruning. There is um, root day, which is good for planting. Um, there is fruit day, really good for drinking and harvesting. And leaf day, which is great also for pruning. So different things that you would do in the vineyards, you only do on certain days of this. And that is just in relation to the cosmos. So if you follow your horoscope a whole lot, you might be really into biodynamics. Um, if um, you think that that's just a load of bull, and um, speaking of bull, um, they're really into bullshit here. And here's why. They actually take the local animal's manure, put it in a cow horn, um, as it is, you know, it's been taken off um, from a dead cow horn. They would not kill a cow for this. Um, emptied out, they put the fertilizer in there, they bury it in the vineyard at a certain time, sometimes tons of them in these certain designs and configurations, bury it. Then at a certain other day in the year, they dig that up, they make a tea out of it, basically a tincture, not to drink, but to spread throughout the vineyards to basically not only symbolize the harmony of the cycle of life and all of that stuff, but also to make sure all those fertilizers and nutrients are getting throughout the entire vineyard. So yes, really into some bullshit here. Um, but if you think it all is too wonky to believe, we're just going to let the wine do the talking. So basically, does biodynamics make better wine? Not necessarily. I've had a lot of amazing wine that was biodynamically grown. And a lot of terrible wine that um, said that they were biodynamically practicing. But fewer of those, because if you're going to take that much time, and it's a very expensive process to convert yourself to biodynamics, if you're going to take that much time and effort to make yourself a biodynamic winery, you care what that wine tastes like. And um, for instance, Donkey and Goat, while they advertise that they are biodynamics, it's not their label. That's not like fully what they just... They're not using biodynamics just as a marketing practice. Their first and foremost thing is we're going to make the best wine possible. And the way we know how that that is most possible for us is to practice biodynamically. So it doesn't matter if you believe in all the cosm cosmos stuff and the greater idea, the greater philosophy of biodynamics. The actual practice of maintaining holistic health in the vineyard itself is unrefutable in terms of how it produces better grapes and thus hopefully better wine unless you're just a terrible winemaker and turn amazing fruit into terrible wine. So tell me what you're smelling this wine and then we'll talk a little bit about carbonic maceration um, before we get into the next wine. Um, let's see here. Man, I got, I got a little nerdy with that biodynamic stuff. Thank you for uh, tracking with me here. Um, um, Here we go. Okay. Yes. Um, super hazy. Absolutely. So this is unfiltered wine. So if you make your wine in these barrels, generally speaking, all of the particles and sediment are going to fall to the bottom of the barrel. And then they siphon off the liquid from the sediment that is settled down to the bottom and put it into bottles. Um, that's unfiltered wine. So you're still going to get some of that particles. You're just not going to get the main part of it because that's settled to the bottom. If though you want a filtered wine, you actually put either egg whites or other chemicals into the wine, to kind of sink down, that kind of capture, um, just like, so egg whites are liquid, but they're heavier, so they're gonna 
sink down and all those particles kind of get stuck in the egg whites and it acts as this filtration or fine unit. Um, so um, generally speaking though, um, biodynamic producers, even though egg whites are natural, they're not going to touch the wine. They're gonna let the wine be what it wants to be. So that's why it's so hazy because you still have all a little bit of those particles kind of hanging out in there. Big time cherry, jammy, plum, raspberry, blackberry, eucalyptus, Definitely some floral things on this one. Barnyardy stuff on the nose too, right? Yeah, we, um, <coughs> that right there is Britannomyces. That actually has nothing to do with the biodynamics. That's actually a fungus that grows in cellars that affects the smell of wine. The fungus doesn't grow in the wine, I promise. Um, but a little bit of that barnyard um, manure um, that they use in the fields kind of is coming through in this wine. Britannomyces, baby. Um, let's see, dried prunes, yes, some herbal notes. Yes, 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 there's so much going on, right? The fruit, the funk, the herbal, there's some woodsy notes in there. Molasses too in the background, I love it. Um, soil aroma, right? We're tasting dirt, um, I love it. Super, super terroir focused is what we'd say. More indicative of the soil than necessarily the uh, grape itself. So earthy with some mushrooms, leaves and roses, yes. Um, past their prime bloom. I like that. So a little of that rotting note. Um, um, I like it. Some dark chocolate. Interesting. I have um, been smelling this wine a whole lot, but oh man, I can't get past the plums. They're so purple on this wine. Everything of the of the white wine, the first one that we had, it was so green and yellow. This is so purple, pink, and red to me. Um, Great question. I'm not sure how old these specific vines are um, uh, for this vineyard. I know they have, they, they do all their stuff estate. Um, and so I do not know how old the specific vines are on this one. So great question though. Um, really jammy when it was colder, but when it warmed up in the glass became a little bit more barnyard and smelly. Yes. So this is one of those wines that is fun with a slight chill on it. It's not totally necessary. I just wanted to see, I wanted you to experience how the wines developed as they started off a little bit more chilled and opened up. So this wine is carbonic maceration, a little bit of a different fermentation process instead of stomping the grapes or pressing the grapes to get the juice released from the skin. Then they stick and um, they, they hang out in what's called a cold stabilization process for about four days sometimes. They keep it really cold so the fermentation process doesn't start. So the tannins and color um, come out of the grape skins and further extracts the wine itself. That's a typical fermentation process. And then it fully ferments and they rack it off the, um, all the, the, pull, the, the skins and stems. Carbonic maceration instead is where all the grapes go into a tank, a really, really large tank generally. And the weight of the grapes on top starts crushing the grapes on the bottom. It's kept a little bit warmer, so fermentation can start. So as these grapes burst on the bottom, the natural ambient yeast in the air, because we have yeast spores all in the air, no matter where we are, starts feeding off of the sugar in those burst grapes on the bottom and start fermenting almost immediately because it's a little bit warmer. It's not kept so cold. Well, that increases the pressure on the bottom because remember carbon dioxide is a byproduct of fermentation. So it builds up the pressure on the bottom, which further makes other grape clusters burst, which starts fermenting those. And then it further creates other grape clusters that burst and start fermenting. Then they just take the free run juice off of that and that's what's bottled. So instead of this long drawn out process where you get more of these tannic, bold, extracted, rich reds, you're maintaining the freshness, the fruitiness, the softness of red wine without those tannins. So carbonic maceration red wines are some of my favorites to enjoy in the summertime because sometimes the tannins, the bitterness, the, the really intense extraction of the flavors, too much. It's just overpowering in the summer. It just makes you so hot and um weighs you down, but um, sometimes I still want a red wine in the summer, even if I'm grilling out outside. This is a perfect wine to do that with. So look for carbonic maceration red wines if you like red wine, but find it difficult to drink in the summertime. If you chill down a red wine that has oak on it and drink that, 
then basically you're numbing or dumbing down all the other flavors of the wine except for the oak. So all you're going to smell and taste in a wine is just straight up oak. So that's not going to be super pleasant. That's why those wines are meant to be served more at room temperature, you know, 65 uh, degrees. Um, so carbonic maceration wines, though, can be served as cold as a white wine if you want it to, or just in the middle, you know, that 55 degrees uh, uh, temperature. So hopefully you enjoy this wine. Very interesting, um, definitely off the beaten path, um, eclectic and experimental winery um, that's producing some really awesome stuff. They really focus on Rhone varieties in this winery. So Syrah, Mouvedre, Grenache, um, Carignan, a lot of those other fun varieties besides Cabernet and Chardonnay. Notice that's not in our four pack. Um, not because I don't like those wines. I love those wines. But this is about celebrating Independence Day and we became a country because we were thinking outside the box um, in terms of what democracy meant and and who we wanted to be as a people. And we weren't going to let tradition dictate that for us. So these wineries are doing that themselves. They're not going to let the tradition of California being Cabernet and Chardonnay dictate what wines they make. So wanted to celebrate those free thinkers. Um, we're going to move on to the Indica Red next by Lioko uh, Winery. This is literally a topographical map of their vineyards, which I love. I just thought it was a design at first. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I found out it is the topographical map of their vineyard and I'm a geography nerd, so I love that. Um, so whenever you're ready, um, go ahead and just pour yourself some of the indica. And I'll read your comments on um, this carbonic maceration Mouvedre and what you thought about it. Um, I haven't even tasted it yet. <laughs> There's so much to talk about with biodynamics and carbonic maceration. No, don't, make wrong. don't get me wrong. I've had this wine before. I picked it for a reason. Um, so I know what it tastes like, but wow. It's just so delicious. I really enjoy that one. So go ahead and pour yourself some of this Lyoko here and um, we'll chat about that soon. Um, so it's super dark and complex, well-balanced, makes me think of homemade plum jam that your mom made. I like it. It does, it's very homey, right? It tastes um, almost um, <sighs> rustic. That's the word I'm looking for. This. Um, it's not super polished and it's not meant to be. It's meant to be rusted um, off the bean path. Yeah. Love that little bit of sparkle, right? So carbonic maceration does have that. It's slightly almost fizzy and that will go away the more you swirl it again. But when you first open it and it's chilled, it does have that slight spritz to it, which is really refreshing too. Um, cool. I am uh, love everyone's tasty notes on this one. What would you all enjoy this with? Can you see this um, grilling out steaks, burgers, hot dogs when you want a red wine, but um, you want something a little bit more fresh and approachable? How would you enjoy this one? Um, what are your favorite? Okay. Kept us wanting more out of it. Yeah. So this wine is not meant to be... Um, you know, that rich, extracted, kind of soak, sink into a, a heavy couch of, of um, and just like be in vibrant, um, rustic in a simple but uh, delightful way. So if you wanted more of that richness and intensity, this wine just isn't that wine. But um, hopefully, I could see this wine um, being really good with some spicier foods too. Because it's fruitier, it's softer, it doesn't have those intense tannins, that acid is lower, um, could work really well with some spicier foods when sometimes it's hard to pair red wine with spicier foods. So salmon or ahi tuna off the grill. Yes, often it's so hard to find a red wine that you could do with seafood, and this is definitely one of those. Pork chops, please. Yes, a little, a little bit of char on the outside of that. Um, some like cherry gastric or um, something uh, something fruity um, on top. Yes, love it. Um, cool, grilled salmon, yes, saw that, yes. My dad is an expert at grilled salmon. So um, especially if, had, um, if you did a glaze on it that had a little bit, of that, a little bit more of that Worcestershire, that, um, that smokiness, uh, soy sauce, anything a little bit with that tinge, some ginger in there, garlic, um, this wine would be perfect with that. Um, I uh, 
Yeah, I think I opened this wine up to write a review on it. I used a Coravin because I didn't want to open up the whole bottle. Um, this has been a recurring theme of late. Um, when I find that wine and I, you know, pour this much to write the review on it and think, oh, uh, I'm going to need another glass of that. So I use the Coravin again, pour a glass of that. I'm like, well, I want another one. So I end up just opening the wine and, um, and, and, and pouring it that way. So I love wines like that, that, um, I don't know, just, uh, yeah, they just beg for that extra sip. One more sip, one more sip. Um, so, um, all right. Ooh, Croatian lamb. Okay. Uh, I can, I can, um, I don't know what the flavor profile of that is, but I would, um, I'd say this would be great with some kebabs for sure. Um, um, love that. So, all right, let's taste some Lioko. This is probably the least, all of the other wines had some seriousness going on in terms of discussion, whether it's biodynamics or what pet nat is um, or pruning and viticultural practices. But Lioko, we have here just to enjoy. So this is Karen Yen. Karen Yan, that is not aged in oak. So again, this is one of those red wines that you could chill down a little bit if you wanted to. It's perfectly fine temperature, um, but it's not going to just taste like oak. Um, so, and if you've got the bottle, uh, challenge you, I love, there's like, there's, I could practice for the rest of my life and I'll never be as good as writing wine reviews, tasting notes and pairing recommendations as they are. So um, I'm not even gonna try very hard. Y'all just turn around the label and see for yourselves Whenever I taste this wine with the rep who brings me theirs, um, he pours me a sample and then asks me aroma notes, taste notes, pairing recommendations, and I have to guess to see what they might say about their wine because they're so specific. Let's let's say this, Italian plum on the nose. Um, not red plum, not black, Italian plum specifically. Um, chai spice, um, violette liqueur, and mulberry, like so specific, in-depth. I love, love, love their notes. Um, food pairings, yes, bistro burgers, classic, great, but also merguez sausages and pork shoulder tacos. Um, so specific. <laughs> I love it. I just um, dig all their notes. So I'm going to finish up this um, donkey and goat, and then I'll love pour myself some Lioko too. Whew. Yeah, I'm going to need some more of that later. Um, all right, so Lioko is the name of the winery, all in caps. Um, it's just a made-up word. They focus also on Rhone varieties, so Grenache, Shiraz, Carignan, Mouvetera, just like Donkey and Goat. Um, and they use really old vines here. So while I didn't know the age of the vines for the last one, some of their vineyards um, that they are getting um, this Carignan from are 70-plus years old. So why does age of the vine make a difference at all? Does older vines necessarily make better wine? And the answer is no. When older vines are healthy and are able to continue to produce grapes that make delicious wines, mm -hmm. there's something spectacular about them. Um, but older vines, just like people, we become more disease prone as we get older. So a vine can only continue to sustain a crop that's if it's healthy. Um, Phylloxera is one of the biggest things that actually um, destroys vines. Uh, Phylloxera is a louse that is native to the east coast of uh, the United States, actually. And it feeds off of it, eats the root stock, uh, the roots of the vines. Um, the vines that we have that are native to this area are Scuppernong, Muscadine, Norton, um, Concord, all of those American um, um, natural uh, grapevines. That rootstock is too thick and bitter for Phylloxera to really literally sink its teeth into. So it never really was a problem here in the U.S. Well, once um, the Brits um, and the Spaniards were colonizing the Americas, they were bringing vines from Europe over to plant in the Americas, and they were bringing American vines over to Europe to plant there because they were different. They're like, let's see, let's 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 figure out what's up. Little did they know, and this is why we have customs now where you have to say whether or not you walked in um, walked in farmlands. Um, they brought this louse with them to Europe. Well, this louse loves the European grapevines. Think Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, all the classic grape varieties that we know of are what's called Vitis vinifera. That's the genus and species of the grapevine. 
Well, um, Phylloxera is all about some vitis vinifera. And so from 1850 to 1920, it didn't decimate European grapevines because that just means killed off one in every 10. Instead did the opposite. It killed off nine out of 10 grapevines all throughout Europe. So um, totally ruined um, the entire economy of wine for European wines um, and was this um, very, very fast moving thing that just kind of just took over all of Europe and killed off 90% of grapevines. Um, it took a while for them to figure out what to do about it. They finally figured out they needed the rootstock of like scuppered muscadine kind of uh, grapes with the vine, the top part of the vine of what we wanted to make the grapes, Cabernet, Pinot Noir, whatever. So they graft them together. They take the roots, they take the top of the vine that they wanted to eat the fruit out of, put them onto the roots. You literally like tie them up together so it eventually grows into one unit. Um, and so to this day, um, the vast majority of all vines throughout the entire world are actually grown on American rootstock that have European vine toppings. Um, Veloxera, though, doesn't like sandy soil or volcanic soil. So there's some pockets throughout the world that still have original rootstock. And if you're interested more about this, um, I have my list of classes that I'll put out. But um, at the end of July, I'm going to start a soil series. I'm going to start with volcanic series. And we're going to be tasting some of these wines that actually have 200-year-old vines because they are grown in volcanic soil, so they never actually were wiped out with phylloxera. They still have their original rootstock. Pretty darn cool. So just kidding. I said I wasn't going to get nerdy for this wine, but I got nerdy anyways. That was not planned. Um, we were just talking about the age of the vine. So 70-year-old um, uh, vines on this one, but a mix mostly carrying on. We do have a little... Valdigay and Valdigay is a grape that's usually blended in southern France. Um, never thought to be a delightful wine in and of itself, but a couple producers are actually playing around with making a 100% Valdigay. Um, I featured one, the Folk Machine, if you if you had it in one of your six packs before. So, tell me what you're smelling and tasting in this wine. Hopefully, it is just plain delight of the senses. Maraschino cherries, yes, all of the red cherries, and they're candied, right? The other ones, the other one was funky, and it was definitely had that like I'm a natural wine. I don't shave my armpits or wear deodorant kind of thing. <laughs> this wine is just pretty. It's lovely. It's feminine. It's soft. It's bright. Yes, candied fruit aroma, cherry with hints of eucalyptus. Yeah, that bright, fresh. If you've ever done this, um, try it. Um, you take fresh eucalyptus, just get it at the floral shop, just the sprigs of it. Put it in your shower, um, tie it around the shower head. Um, as it constantly rehydrates in the shower, as you run the shower, the steam of your shower will just smell like eucalyptus and it just your senses and your pores. It's really refreshing and delightful, especially if you've got allergies or sinus problems like I do. Um, and it stays good for like a year. You just keep the same two sprigs in your shower for like a year and you'll constantly have that smell. So um, highly recommend that. Um, some baked goods. Yeah, so there's some like spices, some baking spices, not like pepper in here, but a little like clove and allspice maybe. Um, I like it. Jammy black fruit, some blackberry, plums, currants, smoked leather and, and brets. Like Britannomyces? A bit. Okay, so you do get a little bit of barnyard in here. Okay, Just a bit. talking to some pop over here. So um, that might be left over in the glass from the donkey and goat. So if you are getting a little bit of that funk, this wine definitely does not have that. If you are getting some of that, swirl the wine around a little bit more. It might be just a tinge of that uh, donkey and goat left You're over in your other um in, in your other glass. So just swirl it around and you can even do a puff of air into the glass to kind of push those aromas out. So it pushes those aromas out of the glass and then you kind of get a fresh bouquet. So it should be strictly like fruit, herb, spice, um, some woodsy notes, but none of that funk of the last one. Um, cardamom. So a little bit different spice notes in here and that's not coming from the oak. A lot of times when we get spice in wines, it's because the oak that the wine was aged in, this wine was not aged in oak. Neutral oak, um, meaning super old. It's not imparting flavors, just imparting a rounder texture of the wine. Um, so neutral oak is not imparting those spices. That's Carignan. Carignan can be a spicy, savory grape. Um, 
usually with like red spices. That would be that cardamom, cinnamon, allspice kind of thing. Um, I get some like red earth in here. Some like that cl dusty clay, you know, that smells very different than um, dusty other things, that red earth. Um, I guess more iron content in it. Um, coffee, I like that. I like that that coffee and definitely anise. Um, so the licorice that I'm getting in here, which we can call it anise or licorice, whatever you want to call it, fresh green herbal licorice rather than that candied black bitter licorice. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you've ever just cut it straight up like Thai basil, um, kind of get that um, aromatic in here. So, so um, this is Carignan, uh, Ryan. So this is 93% Carignan with 7% Valdigay um, or Valigue. Um, if you want to be super French about it. So, um, whoo, just love this wine. I just, I want this wine with like chilled pasta with Kalamata olives. I love carrying on with anything more olivey and briny. Um, something smoked too. I can see this with smoked salmon rather than grilled salmon. I, I love carrying on with anything of that smokier quality. So, mm. I'm not spitting that, that's delicious. Um, yes, it is a great wine. So check it out, Ryan, in Maryland. They have it up there, Lyoko. Um, and this is their Indica Red. Um, oh man, I love that minerality too. It's just like these tiny fine grained um, kind of textural components on the wine. Definitely not like oak where it just kind of over assaults your, your gums and your cheeks. It's definitely just like these fine green tannins from the grape itself that, um, that just balance complexity. A little bit of this more masculine edge because it is such a fruit forward wine. Um, it's it's lovely to have that balance. So, all right. So, of all four wines, did any of them particularly grab me by the heartstrings and and open your eyes a little bit wider? Did you think a little bit more about? Um, wow, I never knew a red wine could taste like this or a sparkling wine could taste like this or um, anything inspire you a little bit to think about summer, July 4th, grill out, summer, anything like that. So, um, uh, Porchetta as a pairing. Yes, absolutely. Could totally see that. Uh, Veal sauce and buca too. Um, I want something salty with this. It's so juicy. The fresh is right. Um, the fresh is right. The fruit is fresh. The acidity. Um, I, I want something kind of salty with this, which is why I was thinking olives, but um, salt and buca, um, or like mushroom burgers. Um, I could see that too. I think a regular burger might overpower the flavor of this wine since it's a little softer, um, but a mushroom burger would be uh, really nice with this one too. So, um, uh, so Danielle loves the pet nat and uh, James loves the Lyoko. Yes, that is often how it is when it comes to um, uh, significant others and uh, their decisions about wine. So Sam, Mom, what, which of the four grabbed you the most? I'm a, I'm a, a red wine, but I like the number one. All right. So she prefers red wines generally. She loves Cabs and Malbecs. Um, but she said number one was uh, one of her favorites. So that Vermentina. I, I wrote it was highly drinkable. Highly drinkable, she said. I love that. That is like the best compliment for a winemaker. Like you want your wines to be highly drinkable, right? Um, none of these wines are austere and unapproachable and difficult. They're all interesting, um, but highly drinkable. I love it. Some pop, what was your? Some of them were so good. I would order that four pack. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. He says all four couldn't choose between. He needs to order all four. I approve of that decision for sure. Um, Tawana agrees with you. She says all four were great. Pet Nat really stood out for me as a new taste, right? Like I've never had, I've had some Pet Nats before, a few and far between because now a ton of people are making them, um, but nothing quite like that before. That was super, super delightful. Um, Definitely bringing some of that down to the Outer Banks uh, next week. So, um, uh, and then James, I agree with Son Mom. Usually like the res, but number one was good. Mm. Awesome, cool. I am um, so I think generally across the board, I prefer white wines because I like the acidity. Um, I'm like an acid head. I just love that. But often I struggle with white wines and sparkling wines. Um, 
either acid reflux sometimes or sometimes some allergies that I just can't figure out what it is. Um, and they're sometimes just really difficult to find the ones I can drink. And I love, I love both of these wines um, and both of these reds, um, all four for very different occasions, maybe even the same day, just different times of the day or with different meals. Um, that a hot sauna put the pet nat more in a cidery category to me, right? Absolutely. Wasn't in a traditional wine category at all, um, which made it fun. But um, I never feature beers in uh, wine in, in any of my classes or events. Um, I only talk about wine. I don't even talk about spirits except for drinking tequila and gin. Y'all all know those are my things. But um, it's, fun to, it's fun to have a wine that kind of fits that beer category, that cider category. Um, so Jen says, agree with some pot, all four delicious. Yes, great lineup. Awesome. First red was a favorite. Second red was Brandon's favorite, but really loved all four. Well, that's fabulous. Um, I always get nervous when I do classes like this because people sign up for a California wine class and they have certain expectations. They want oaky, buttery Chardonnays. They want full, rich, extracted reds. They want bold wines, smooth wines, soft wines. It's really just like flamboyant flavors. Um, these wines weren't like that at all. And so I get nervous when I, sometimes I, I'm scared I go too far outside the box, but I'm glad y'all were tracking with me and enjoyed all of these wines. Um, it was a treat to share them all with you today. So just so everyone knows, I'm taking off next week. I will um, not be doing any classes next week. We're going to start up the week after that, though, and I'm about to put out an email um, for the rest of the classes. But we're going to start with a rosé class. Um, when I get back, so that'll be like July 15th. Let me see here. Um, July 15th will be a rosé class. July 22nd, so that'll be the Wednesday after that, will be another blind tasting class. And we're going to do the same thing like we did last time. I'm just going to learn to do it a little bit better. Where we taste four different wines. They're all going to be red this time again. One grape for different regions. So you're going to really figure out how to break down the region. And I promise we'll, we'll be a little bit more now that I've tried that one time before I've worked out some of the kinks and so we'll know how to do that better. And then finally that volcanic uh, soil series class that I was talking about earlier, that'll be on the 29th. So we've got three really cool classes coming up, um, but you're on your own for next week, Wednesday. I hope that you um, drink some good wine on that Wednesday and maybe take a picture of it and tag me in it and tell me what you are drinking. Um, and you know you'll see all the pictures of all of the wine we'll be drinking on vacation. So um, jumping up and down about the rosé class. Yes, actually, Danielle, I have you to thank for this. I I, I hadn't actually thought about doing a rosé class. I usually feature them in my in-person classes every spring and do a rosé class, but I hadn't thought about doing a virtual one. So um, definitely doing that. And it will be kind of like this California class. We're going to talk about four very different styles of rosé. They will, like can't be further apart. So I'm gonna have fun finding those interesting and eclectic um, for uh, rosé. So all my wines are four wines for the wine classes. If you're by yourself or just don't wanna open up four wines on a Wednesday, you can always just open up two, watch it live for those two, and then open up two later, maybe on the weekend, and watch the rest of the video uh, for the recording. Or you can just drink the wine. You don't actually have to attend the class. Um, although I always love seeing you guys and participating um, in the wines with you. Um, but the recordings are there. That's why I do it on YouTube so that you can uh, watch those recordings at any time. Um, and if you have any other ideas of classes that you'd like to see me feature in terms of the um, the virtual classes, please let me know. Um, that was all thanks to you, Danielle. So um, I'm always happy to take ideas. So um, thank you all so much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time and uh, dedication to being wine nerds. Um, I hope that you drink some great wine over July 4th and celebrate safely with your family and friends and loved ones. So those are kind of this category sometimes, but maybe not always. Um, regardless, whatever loved ones you're with or family and friends, or maybe all three, um, I hope you have a really good time. So thank you all, and we will see you next time. Happy July 4th.